Welcome to Cooper Hewitt. I'm so delighted to have you all here. I'm Ellen Lupton. I'm curator of contemporary design. And tonight's event is held in conjunction with an exhibition that just opened two weeks ago called Face Values, Exploring Artificial Intelligence. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We have some amazing explorers here to show you the way. Um, and they are all featured in the exhibition. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, it's open until the end of April, and you'll have a chance to experience for yourself um, AI and facial recognition technology. Um, the exhibition actually originated last year at the London Design Biennale, when Cooper Hewitt was proud to represent the United States of America in the 2018 London Design Biennale, and we commissioned the original work by Luc Dubois, Zach Lieberman, and Jessica Helfand to explore facial detection and more specifically emotion detection and facial measurement as um, ideas and technologies that are being incorporated into all kinds of products and systems that we use from your iPhone to um, surveillance and security equipment. Um, and it's often working there in the background. We don't always know how well it works or why it's there or whose faces it's based on. Um, so these pieces that were created by these amazing artists and um, historians really get inside of that and allow you to experience it. Um, so tonight we're going to have short presentations by each of our three creative guests, and they're going to talk about their work um, in relation to these themes and, and what's in the exhibition, but also a bit more broadly. They are amazing people and amazing contributors to the future of design. October is a crazy month at Cooper Hewitt. It's like design month. It's always design month at Cooper Hewitt, but like on speed in October. Um, we have the, the, the whole week of October 12th through 19th. It's called Design Week. I think we invented that. Lots of other cities do it too, but we started it. We have a design career fair. We have a design fest for all ages. Um, we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the National Design Awards with an amazing gala, and you can buy a table or five tables and make us survive the century. There's a winner's salon in relation to that event with 20-minute programs featuring some of the most important designers um, of our time who all got prizes from Cooper Hewitt over the last 20 years. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that. Um, there's another event planned in relation to face values. Hi, we're my good people. Um, Karen Palmer is an interactive filmmaker who we commissioned to create a brand new piece for face values. And she will be back here on October 29th talking about her piece and bias and artificial intelligence. And she'll be joined by Emily Balsitis, who's a behavioral psychologist from NYU. It's going to be amazing. Karen is a force of nature. All the work in Face Values is like created by these amazing people for this um, exhibition. And we, I just feel so lucky to have been able to collaborate and be part of it. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Luc Dubois. And I want to tell you a little bit about Luke. <laughs> he, he's amazing. He's a, an award-winning composer. He's a coder. He's a software guy. He's a teacher. He's an advocate, an advocate for inclusive design and an inclusive society. He's the director of the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Um, and much of his um, visual work explores the limits of portraiture in the digital age by linking human identity to data and social networks. The guy has a brain in a skull on the shoulders. So, Luke, come do it. <laughs> Yeah, 
Um, hey, so I don't, I don't, um, I don't use PowerPoint, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, I'm, I'm bad at this. Um, quick show of hands. How many of you have ever seen the film Desperately Seeking Susan? Amazing. How many of you have never seen this film? Oh wow. Okay, you need to see this movie. This movie, listen, this movie explains everything. Okay, so quick recap. 1985, um, directed by Susan Seidelman. Most people think it's starring Madonna. It is not starring Madonna. It's starring Roseanne Arquette. It's featuring Madonna. Um, uh, it is a movie about a woman who lives in Fort Lee, New Jersey, who has a little bit too much time on her hands and gets obsessed with the personal ads in the back pages of Village Voice whereupon she discovers a real live couple who are communicating in a long distance relationship through the personal ads. The man rolls into town, he puts out an ad saying, desperately seeking Susan, meet me at Pier 40 on Thursday at five o'clock. She decides she wants to observe this couple because she thinks it's incredibly romantic. Somebody gets hit on the, he hit on the head, there's mistaken identity, shenanigans ensue. This movie, um, to me, is, 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 is incredibly relevant to our cultural moment because it's, it's, what it's ultimately about is it's about someone who crosses a Rubicon from observer to actor in a social situation in which normally they would not be included, right? So if you think about how we participate in social media these days, and click likes on things, how we perform in social media, and how we sort of have constructed our lives in the last few years. It's just, you should watch this movie. Um, uh, as Ellen mentioned, I make portraits. Most people, when they think of portraits, they think of this. Um, this is um, Gilbert Stewart's portrait of George Washington, the so-called so Lansdowne portrait, which is in a Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. called the National Portrait Gallery. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in this portrait, right? He's got a sword, but it's in his left hand because he's a man of peace. There's a rainbow out the window that like, you know, my six month old could have drawn. It's got like, you know, the kind of stuff. Um, I make portraits um, based on data. So uh, let me find you one. Um, so like this is, so here, this is my portrait of George Washington. This was commissioned for the 2008 Democratic National Convention. Um, and these are the 66 words in his State of the Union addresses that he uses more than any other president. So the word he uses more than anybody else, most commonly, is gentleman. George W. Bush, who was president at the time I made this piece, his number one word is terror. And the way you get from gentleman to terror in 43 easy steps is a history lesson of the political rhetoric of the United States, right? Bill Clinton spent most of his presidency talking about the century in which he would no longer be president, right? Ronald Reagan is deficits. Um, Richard Nixon, interestingly, is truly, um, you have to keep in mind that one of Richard Nixon's speechwriters was an amateur linguist by the name of Bill Sapphire, who also counted words. Um, a sequel to this project would be, um, I tried to make a, a sort of sequel to this, it was more about how Americans describe themselves. And so I did this project in 2010 where I made a census of the United States. I joined um, 21 different online dating services as a straight man, a gay man, a straight woman, a gay woman in every zip code in America, and downloaded 19 million people's uh, dating profiles and made maps. Um, so what this is showing you is this is where all the lonely people are. Lonely people tend to be in the um, you know, Appalachia. This is where all the shy people are. Shy people tend to be in the upper Midwest. Um, this is showing you that Nebraska is not particularly funny. And this is showing you where all the kinky people are. So this is telling you that um, men in southern New Mexico and women um, in uh, West Virginia need to get together and have a good time. <laughs> then what I did was I went through and replaced the name of every city in the United States with the word people use more in that city than anywhere else in the country. So if you've ever dated anyone from Seattle, this makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, I grew up um, somewhere, this sort of will make sense to you, I grew up somewhere between annoying and cynical in New Jersey. <laughs> um, and, um, and my favorite one is, um, you know, New York City's number one word overall is now. Uh, which which solves the sentence right right now now I work as a waiter but actually I'm an actor right that's something people say in New York um, but my favorite would be you know if you go upstate right so um, so the only good place to eat in Syracuse New York is a Hell's Angels barbecue joint called Dinosaur Barbecue right so this is where you would take someone on a date right so this is this is sort of what I do. Um, when I make uh, portraits. Um, not all of them are quite fun and games, so uh, for the last three years I've been touring a piece called um, Take a Bullet for This City. It's a live firing Walter PPK 9mm semi-automatic that fires a blank 
uh, whenever someone's shot in the city it's in by tapping a civic open data feed. The vitrine it's in fills up with bullet casings. This is called data visualization. Data visualization is a problem in our society, not a solution. We can talk about that some other time. Um, and so I, um, I do stuff like that. I also make a lot of films, and I thought I'd show, I thought I'd, since we're talking about machine learning, I thought I'd show you, tell you two quick stories, a, a, a fun one and a, a fun one about how I've used machine learning at work and maybe a slightly more serious one. The fun one is, um, is um, uh, I did a soundtrack for a film once about Star Wars about 10 years ago. Um, where um, the filmmaker, it was, an, it was an artist commentary of Star Wars, so you can imagine a director commentary with only with a split screen, and instead of it being you know, George Lucas talking about whatever, it was an art history lecture. The artist was named John Powers, he's a sculptor, and, and he made this really interesting kind of tour de force redo of the first Star Wars movie with the following conspiracy. What if instead of it being a real pop culture, man with a thousand faces kind of film. What if it was a really smart intertextual critique of post-war modern art? So every time you see a lightsaber, you talk about Dan Flavin. Every time you see the Death Star, you talk about the Pruitt-Igoe housing complex in the city of Venice, right? Um, right? And Luke Skywalker is Robert Smithson. Right? So he asked me to do the music, right? And so what I did, so it turns out that Philip Glass and John Williams went to school together. Right, they were both students at the Juilliard School. And so I imagined a long lost collaboration where they wrote music together. And so I took all the, all the 70s keyboard pieces of Philip Glass and threw them in the computer. And then I took all the harmonies and melodies of Star Wars and threw them in the computer and ran a thing called a neural net, which is a term, a thing that you do, I guess, when you're doing AI. Um, and this is what came out. And this is what came out. So you end up with a thing that strangely sounds just like Steve Reich, but that's not the point, um, that has the harmonies and melodies of Star Wars with the keyboard and rhythmic performance practice of 1970s era of Philip Glass. So that's kind of an upshot. That's, a, that's, a, that's an upside of, of machine learning story. The downside of machine learning story is, is you know, the, so the, the Defense Department of the United States does a, do, does a design challenge every year where they put um, several million dollars of funding on the table, uh, mostly to universities, and ask them to solve, them, solve a problem for them, right? And I, and I teach it in engineering school, so I have sort of, sort of intimate knowledge of this challenge. Um, and uh, in January 2002, they put out the following challenge, right? The Defense Department of the United States put out the following challenge. They said, if we give you a bunch of videotape, and don't tell you anything else about it, can you help us find one specific person? Oh. And so if you rewind your mind back to January 2002, you can sort of guess who they were looking for. <laughs> they were looking for a specific person, they were looking for him very hard, and they were looking everywhere they could, and they needed a little bit of help. This is actually in some ways a good STEM advocacy story, because the winning team was not from NYU, certainly was not from MIT, was not from Caltech. It was actually from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is the largest public engineering school in the United States. Uh, and, the, and the student design team that hacked it figured out how to modify a, a standard algorithm for recognizing faces, a thing called the Har Cascade, to take into account cultural variations in hairstyle and facial hair. Right, um, and so I decided to implement that exact algorithm on the one person on the planet who would never need to be found that way, which is Britney Spears. Um, and so I took um, 5,000 paparazzi photos of Britney Spears and trained my computer to find her. And I can find her in any footage in the world. So I can put any live footage, music video footage, whatever, of Britney Spears through this, and it will detect her and lock her eyes. Um, in place, and this is a portrait in the MPG, right? So this is an, this is another Smithsonian commission, and the 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 sort of conceit of this piece is that we have a we have a really um, disturbing cultural double standard in the United States around surveillance and observation, where we are very um, risk adverse to the idea of being watched, but then there's people like this who we could look her up on TMZ and find out what what she had for breakfast this morning, and that's maybe not. Not super fair. Um, so that's what I have to say to you. Um, and we'll show you some other stuff in a little bit. Thanks. Cool. So uh, we have a little.
tech change here. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Jessica Helfand, who contributed a beautiful piece in our show upstairs about the history of, of facial measurement. So we like to think about, you know, AI is something that just got invented yesterday and the robots are coming and no one will ever have to work again and Pete will give us all a thousand dollars a week or whatever. That's the other guy. Um, but actually the, the kind of thinking behind facial detection technology goes back hundreds of years um, and there's a long history to us wanting to or artists and scientists wanting to measure people's heads in order to determine whether they're good people, bad people, beautiful people, ugly people, criminals, whatever. Um, Jessica Helfand uh, is publishing a book called Face, A Visual Odyssey with MIT Press. It's coming out next month. Um, and I was excited to be able to work with her as a historian for this exhibition to look at the history of how we measure faces. Um, so she's gonna talk a little bit about her book um, and some of the philosophy behind faces. She's the founding editor of Design Observer. She is the author of numerous books on design and cultural criticism, including Screen, Essays on Graphic Design, New Media and Visual Culture, Scrapbooks in American History, um, and Design, The Invention of Desire. So thank you, uh, Jessica. It really sucks to go after Luke. <laughs> uh, I thought I talked fast. I now know I don't talk fast. Uh, but I'm not measuring. No measuring will happen in the next 10 minutes. Um, I'm here to talk about measuring. I lied. Uh, this is Sylvia Sidney. She was said to have the saddest eyes in the world in 1933, a time that was very sad. And we probably all had sad eyes then. Uh, but what I want to talk about as I show the next few images uh, is the fact that, um, you know, I was thinking about this as I was driving down here yesterday, that uh, in business school there's a magazine called Poets and Quants. For people who go to business school, you are either a poet or a quant, suggesting you are a visual person of creative means or you count things. Well, I'm here to say we're all quants. And that quant goes back really far in everyone's DNA, it goes across cultures, and where it lands on the face, I think is really interesting and, and, and something we need to pay attention to. So this is beauty. This is what beauty looked like in 1933. This is Max Factor. And that contraption on top of that woman's head was actually developed for Hollywood to be able to calculate very specifically how makeup was put on the face so that the camera would catch it the right way. There's nothing pernicious or particularly difficult about that except that it's a big ass thing to put on her. And there's another one, it's called a psychograph, right? The psychograph is 1931, 1934. But this idea that we measure beauty and that beauty is, has an absolute value uh, is an, really, I think, a very curious thing. And, and Luke mentioned a moment ago this line between surveillance and observation. I think there's another line that's very thin, which is the line between measuring as something that is quantifiable and demonstrable and maybe even scientific and something that's actually really pernicious. So here on the left, you've got a man who's measuring a woman in Tibet in the 19, early 1930s, I think 1938 actually. He later went on to work with the Nazi SS party to help identify Jews. And on the right, for those of you who are old enough to remember, is Marlo Thomas. The exact same image. She was a TV star in the 1960s, and doesn't she look happy to have her face measured? It's the same image. Calipers are calipers. And the idea that you can measure someone's face as a social determinant, as a moral determinant, as a cultural determinant, as a racial determinant, is what I'm here to talk about. So this is where it gets really messy. This is Sir Francis Galton in the late 1880s, and he develops something he calls composite portraiture. So instead of measuring side by side, he's measuring something on top of something else. He's literally doing what something Luke mentioned a moment ago. He's putting the eyes together and he's locking eyes between people of similar social strata. Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, white people, black people. What is he looking for? He's looking for a kind of pictorial averaging. And he did this in the 1880s after a suggestion by the Victorian philosopher and social prominent liberal theorist, um, Herbert Spencer, that this was the best way to create an average of a group. So the idea that you would average to quantify, you would meld them, you would morph them together by, by putting them on, on a plate. 
This is what they were going for. This is called the Fitter family. So in the 1920s, as eugenics is becoming, taking hold in America, this idea of measuring is about this culture ideal. It's always white, it's always based on some beauty standard that's completely ridiculous. So the Fitter family was only made more absurd by a similar contest across America in fairs and in churches and across different kinds of um, community organizations called um, the Perfect Baby. Um, so there's fitter families, and there's the perfect baby, and everybody wants to look like this. So where does this start? Scientists believe for a long time throughout the 19th century that you could determine intelligence, human ability, and even criminality by measuring the skull. Skull. So I, I'm going to make a distinction in a moment between the skull and the face, but basically it begins with the cranium. So we have this thing called phrenology. Now, now, in the interest of full disclosure, I grew up with a crazy father who collected phrenology heads. So my whole life, my father, who was the world expert on quackery, loved this stuff because it, it was crack for him, right? It was like the idea, this is a prostitute, right? The idea that we could tell that she was a woman of ill virtue because of the way her skull was shaped. But it's not just phrenologists and crazy crack seekers like, like my father and people that practice phrenology. This idea that you could decide who was intelligent based on not just the skull, but measuring the features and the relative position on the face, the trajectory of the nose as a determinant of intelligence, for example. So you can laugh at the fact that a nose shows crafty treachery or pessimistic gloom or scientific truth. I'm sure I've dated all of those men who have those noses, by the way, and they all really are those people. It's a joke until you look at the fact that the white nose is a superior species to a person who is of a race that doesn't have a Caucasian features nose with that line. So it starts to get a little scary. And then you get into this idea of the ideal type. Okay, so we talk about typecasting. It really has a long and difficult and pernicious history. But on the right, you, you probably can't tell from there, but this is a chart that actually compares the circumference of a black child skull and the circumference of a white child skull. So the idea that measuring is comparison has its roots in all of this work. So this is the image that got me excited about writing a book about this stuff. First of all, I love this guy that his lungs are on his cheek, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, that his heart's in his chin, his stomach is, is on his jowls, I mean, like, what's not to love? The haircut alone, he's just beautiful. So this is a book from 1903. It was called Vaught's Practical Character Reader, and this is the beginning of something called physiognomy, which is the art of character reading from the face. It was funny, it was highly illustrated, it was very whimsical, it was really messed up, and it, it persisted throughout a good 40 or 50 years in the last century. But lest you think that this is racially specific to white people, you have to look at this. Same year, 1903. On the left, children of the poor and uneducated. On the right, children of pure and intelligent parents. So you were meant to actually study this stuff. There were textbooks given to schools. There were entire curricula based around the idea that you should learn about reading in the face and therefore pick a better partner, have a better job, have a better job interview, be a better citizen. Really strange. Then it becomes a game, 1930s, okay? But this game hides something that's very specific. There's a guy named Jacques Penry who was a consultant to the police in the US, Canada, and Britain for more than 40 years, and he was the guy that made this thing completely of use to not only people who were buying games and reading books about intelligent and pure parents, but the police. So if you go upstairs and see the exhibit, uh, there's many examples of this in the timeline that Ellen invited me to contribute. On the left is from a guy named Alphonse Bertillon. He's the guy that gave us the mugshot. This is the late 1880s, calipers in use. He decided that we needed to understand everything about criminal activity by measuring people's eyebrows and noses and chins. But on the right, that's work he's doing for uh, the, the British uh, police force in the 1970s. So Bertillon in the 1880s, this is almost 100 years later, and we're still looking at atavism, recidivism, the fact that we can actually understand that criminals are born not made, made not born, it doesn't matter. If you've got a good set of calipers, you can figure it out. Mock shots are the great dividend that was paid by this. But this is, again, measurement into comparison. This is the beginning of Facebook. 
I'm sorry, it is, right? We measure people. We may not measure their noses with calipers, but we look at what they look like. We read them, we make judgments. And this is what I started to think about, the fact that we're all biased. We all make judgments based on what we see, and we may not be getting out measurements and trying to actually uh, create new atavistic principles or, or be eugenicists, but we do compare things. So that's the scary side of, of, of facial comparison and measurement, but there's also, I think, a more lighthearted side, which is beauty. So again, Facebook, we measure ourselves in, in, in terms of beauty. This is basically the same photograph. One is from a sideshow at the time of P.T. Barnum, and one is a movie star. We measure ourselves in terms of social aspirations. This beautiful picture from the WPA of a girl looking at a window, a black girl looking at this, this thing that she's hung on the wall. There probably were no black movie star pictures she could hang on the wall. And then we look at things like skin color. So does anybody know what that is on the left? It's called a Shirley card. So this Shirley card was, goes back to the mid-1950s. Kodak developed this to test skin color in the printing of film. It was always a woman, she was always Caucasian, and she always looked that stupid. <laughs> she had blonde hair and red lips because you were looking for that color balance. And there's a wonderful scholar uh, in Canada who, if you're interested, has written such amazing things about this. It wasn't, it, they didn't actually retire the Shirley card until the 1970s or 80s. And in fact, you can still find them on eBay and people collect them, they're really hard to find. But the fact that we were actually measuring skin color until recent, recently is, I think, just shocking. Uh, and on the other side is Polaroid. Polaroid did all sorts of studies in the 50s and 60s, and all of the Polaroid records are at the Baker Library at Harvard, uh, really trying to look at black skin. They don't get as much press as Kodak gets for the bad Shirley cards. So what is it about these pictures and the fact that they become documents by which we measure ourselves? And, and again, way before we get to Facebook, there is this whole history that is my crack, which is what I call indexical portraiture. So indexical portraiture is these graphic notations, this visual language of, that confers an incredible authority uh, that tells us who we are and that to which is affixed a headshot. That's Anna Mae Wong. But when you look at this beautiful redolent in history thing that's at the Huntington Library, these are her papers when she landed during the Chinese Exclusion Act, when she landed and became an actor. She's 22 years old, 19 years old. Passports are indexical portraits. ID cards are indexical portraits. The idea that each of these things bespeaks the language of its era, the country it's from, the typography. I mean, I love this stuff because I'm trained as a graphic designer. But more importantly, the picture is the perfunctory thing we stick on it to give it this final legitimacy. And it gets lost. We all become kind of anonymous because what was really interesting are these other forms and how we fit into them. I think report cards are this, right? So. I write in my book about the series of report cards that I got from the collector, Paul Lucas. Every single thing on these cards is wrong. I went into Ancestry.com, I looked at these people, their names are wrong, everything's crossed out. And we look at this as having a kind of authority, a visual authority about who we are as human beings. So if you think about this as the cultural backdrop to surveillance and to the fact that we're all indexed by databases all over the world, we're already losing the identity that is our God-given gift as sentient people with a pulse. And it is that gap between the human and what roboticists now call the humanoid <laughs> that I think is really terrifying. And so all of my work as an artist and a scholar and a writer is, is always working with historical documents to try to reclaim these stories and understand where they went off the rails. Portraits, more measurement. You know, it's the school, the annual school picture. I'm really interested in this sort of visual language of how we compare ourselves to each other. So, before I close, I want to just shift gears quickly. This book. Does anybody know what these are? They're rubber babies. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. So there, I, I, went, I did a deep dive into sex dolls and sex robots and why they have the faces they do and who makes the decisions about why a woman who has a pelvic thrust monitor that you're paying $50,000 for because you don't really want a real woman, don't get me started. This is the baby equivalent. And this is an, an artist named Jamie Diamond who actually studied with the makers of these things and there are people who actually want want a baby that's not a real baby. And so this idea that we are living in a culture where not only are we afraid of being looked at, we, there's also a subset of people who are looking to provide and make and engineer and create these things that are just remarkably human. I mean, they have 
individual hair follicles. They ship smelling like baby powder. There's this whole culture of simulation that you know we're all worried about be, being looked at, at as, as surveillance uh, objects, but I think there's a, a whole artistry to paying it forward in this way that is equally worthy of our scrutiny. All to say, um, I'm taking a shift with this book, and what I want to end with is um, uh, I'm going next week to Europe for a month to work on turning this book, which is 27 chapters about this crazy material, which measurement is only based, uh, to turn it into a television series. Because the stories are deeply impactful, deeply human, heartbreaking, amazing, face transplants, uh, gender fluidity, um, othering, uh, there, there, there's a lot to do and a lot to say. Uh, so I made a trailer for the book, and the beauty of making the trailer was collaborating with a young designer, a filmmaker, and um, we made this trailer, which we shot live action, because when she read the manuscript, she said, it's not a book. It's a story about who we are as people, and let's reclaim those pulses and that humanism. And uh, we cast 30 actors and shot for two days in Brooklyn last month and shot on 16 millimeter film, and it was a real game changer for me. I'm, I'm older than maybe everybody in this room, and uh, I didn't know I could do this, and I'm really excited to see that this material that was all about my measuring, what I found, I mean, the scholarship, I don't know if it's scholarship, but it was a lot of work. It's a lot of work to pull up together. I mean, we all have a face. It's enormous numbers of stories, but the idea that I had to go back and find these stories, and she objectively took it aside and, uh, and realized that this could be something else. Uh, the next chapter for this book is going to be something, I think, quite exciting. And here it is. I hope it works. Can we dim these lights, actually, for one second? You can. OK. Here we go. It is my business to detect and analyze facial characteristics. Every year I make my observations on approximately 20,000 people, and the majority of these are boys and girls. I would like you to observe for yourselves the vast difference between two young girls of opposite type. The nose and the forehead distinct profiles represent opposite natures. I just want to say that baby, casting a baby was an unbelievable experience. And in order to get the baby to look up and have that expression that is on the cover of the book, which is a collage, which is only half a baby flipped, by the way, because it's all about the fact that we complete the gesture and the cognitive dissonance of what we think we see is never what we see. So it's a little uncanny. Still, we wanted to have a baby uh, that looked like it. And in order to get the baby to do that, um, my friend Maggie, who may be here tonight, as a photographer, had to stand on a chair with her phone like this and play the soundtrack from Frozen. <laughs> and it worked. Thank you. Okay, and now Zach Lieberman is going to speak. Um, Zach also has an amazing piece upstairs uh, in our exhibition. I hope you'll come and try it and experience it. He is using technology to augment the body's ability to communicate. So he's exploring um, physical interfaces with computers, which is really exciting. Um, he's the creator of Open Frameworks, a tool for creative coding. He's co-founder of the School for Poetic Computation. Um, he helped create iWriter, which is an eye-tracking interface designed for people with paralysis. So thinking about how we can control a computer, not just with a mouse, but actually with your eyes is really cool. Um, 
he's actively exploring the face as a controller and interface for software. And he does it in a way that's like really fun and beautiful to look at. And I kind of wanted to end with Beauty and Zach. <laughs> um, so I'm super honored to be here. I will tell you, please never agree to speak after Luke and Jessica. Um, very intimidating. Um, I want to give you a few um, like interesting facts about this exhibit. So what you see upstairs was presented before, as Ellen mentioned, at the London Design Biennial. And there's this beautiful part of the exhibit, which is these like insane sculpture and kind of architecture. So just want to give a shout out to Matter Design, who created this. And there, there's a beautiful thing that happened, which is we built and prototyped all of this, um, this, this whole design in New York, and then shipped it to London, and actually Gravity is different in London than it is in New York. So when you put these rod, these, these sort of insane rods in the space, and they dipped in a different way in London, and there was a bit of a sort of gravity crisis. Um, the second thing that I'm going to tell you, which is that these are sort of hints or clues, is you have to ask um, Jessica and Ellen about their scarves. So they're both wearing incredible scarves. So please, like, yeah, take advantage of that. Um, so I'm an artist. I work with uh, animation and try to create extremely strange things with uh, animated form. Um, love the face and exploring the face. Oftentimes, thinking about how you know we can manipulate the face and you know explore um, kind of expressive space. This is an animation I made after Trump was elected, and I felt like we were living in a cartoon universe, and I wanted to show sort of happiness for the new year and to my deep unhappiness about the political situation. Um, I'm going to show a sort of precursor project, and I'll talk about the project that's upstairs. This project's called Masque La Cara, created together with my partner Momo. We're inspired by the artist and designer Bruno Minari, and he has this amazing spread in his book called Design as Art. And it's um, a collection of faces, but what's so lovely is he's showing you all these kind of, in a sort of economy, how you can use such small amount of things to represent a face, that you only need a few dots, and because our brains are so wired to see faces that you don't need a lot of elements. Um, there's also a concept of paradelia, where you can see faces in things. This is a museum of rocks that look like faces in Japan. I really want to go here. This is a rock that looks like Elvis. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and when we were working on this project, we were really thinking about masks and the kind of culture of masks and where, you know, how, how different cultures use masks to um, tell stories and express you know, what's important to them. Also kind of masks as, a, a, as play. Um, and this project, one of the things that I loved about it, it's a public art project we did in Houston. Every time we would go to Houston, we work with school children, we built crazy masks. And, and then we um, focused really specifically on kind of graphical representation of the face. So how could you sort of show a face with a minimal amount of elements? And the way this installation works is that it's, um, it's a, a camera, and when you approach it, it finds your face, and it kind of shows you your face as a living backdrop to a poster. So it kind of zooms in on your face, and your face becomes the kind of background to a poster that sort of attached on top. And this project was installed in downtown Houston, and you know, it was really delightful. I was this. I filmed this in the back. I was sort of working in the back, and I watched people on the streets kind of come up and and play and start to jam. I, I love this person was using it. All these tattoos on his face, and the software is adding a kind of additional layer of tattoo. Um, sometimes we did kind of playful things with the face. Um, most people are used to Snapchat filters, but we were thinking about more of a kind of at a at a very primitive graphical level. Like, how could we? What's the simplest way we could show a face? And one of the things I loved about this project is, you know, you, if you hide your face, you know, the software disappears. And, and then when you reveal your face, you know, this augmentation pops up. And I could log in remotely from New York and watch people use this project. And one time I, I logged in and I saw somebody on a Segway, and he would slowly come close. And then the software would find his face, and then he would back up, and then the software would lose his face. And I was like, I freaked out. It was so lovely. Um, the project that's upstairs is called Expression Mirror, and the, um, the basic idea is we were thinking, you know, how could you, um, like, mirror expression? And so this is some early test where we're trying to figure out, you know, if I smile or make a weird expression, could I find that in a database? Could I find, could I have a database of faces, and when I make an expression with my face, use that to search for an expression in, in a database? 
Um, and so this is what it looks like. Please come upstairs and, and give it a try. When you come down and sit, it zooms in on your face and it shows you your face with other people's faces. So as you smile, it will find a smile that looks like yours. Um, and for this exhibit in, uh, in New York, we built also a kind of visualizer. So this is showing a bit of what's happening under the hood. There's a second part where you can see both, um, there's a, a part of this project which uses um, this thing which, is, which I really love called face action coding system, which is essentially the muscle movements of your face. So how the different parts of your face you know, these are the, the actual muscles. These are, you know, nose wrinkler or dimpler, chin raiser. Um, I really like nose wrinkler. It's very sensitive. So if you do this, it kind of, and these, you can think about these white lines as almost a kind of fingerprint. So as you, you know, emote with your face that these lines represent, um, you know, this is how the computer is seeing your face. And uh, I love all the sort of literature about FACS is amazing. I found this video. I was, I was telling Alan I was quite excited to show this video. Um, this is like this insane training video. So act, actors and actresses study FACS, like, you know, to, to sort of experiment with how, I could watch this stuff for days. Um, and the other part of this project, so in addition to looking at the um, muscle activation, the software is also looking at, you know, how do we perceive um, emotional states? So these are trained on a bunch of photographs. So it's showing you, you know, as you use it, it'll say, okay, I'm, I'm detecting this as happiness, anger, fear, sadness. Um, one of the things that I really loved is this project, um, people always sit down and then they take out their phone to take a photograph of it. And when they look down, because this software has been trained on a bunch of photographs, um, the, the computer thinks you're sad when you look down. Because all of the <laughs> photographs of people pretending to be sad, sad they're all like, uh. So when you, when you look down at your phone, it's like the, you get these tears. And I think it's also a sort of commentary about like, grabbing your phone when you're in an interactive work. Um, and, uh, and so you can go upstairs, give this a try. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about as I was watching these two uh, presentations, I was reminded of a few projects that I think are really beautiful. So I'm just going to show them. Um, so I help uh, run and teach at a school called the School for Poetic Computation. And I was thinking of a few student projects that um, I was reminded of in, in the talks. One is called The Average Face Mirror by Sarah Hawarka. And this project's quite beautiful. It's using kind of similar to what Luke was showing, what um, Jessica was showing with this um, alignment on the eyes. This is a mirror. And as you stand in front of this project, it just averages all the faces it finds. So the longer you stand in front of this mirror, it kind of builds a composite face. And it's actually quite amazing because if you come right, up, right at the beginning, you know, you have a very big impact on the image, right? If you're right there in the first few frames, you know, your face has a really big impact on the final result. But after thousands of frames, you have to stand there longer. And so when this project is exhibited, the longer this project is ex exhibited, the, the longer people have to stand. And by the end, it's like slowing down time. It's such a beautiful experience. And the images are very kind of, yeah, quite, quite stunning. Um, the other thing that I really love, Robbie Kraft, who also was a former student, um, he, he, uh, there's this hashtag called Faces and Things, which is a cool hashtag anyway, because it's all of these um, paradelia, objects that uh, look like faces, and he ran it through the face detector. So the, the way I explain it, so the faces and things are like, you know, images that look like that. And he downloaded thousands of them. Um, and then he ran them through a face detector. So he said, you know, can the computer find a face in this? And then when you average them, you get this kind of like haunting face. So it's finding faces in things that are not really faces. And then when you average them together, you wind up with this kind of eerie composite, which is it's almost like a ghost of what the computer thinks a face is. The last thing I will say, so sort of back to the project upstairs. So I had this experience yesterday. I, w I um, was asked to come speak to some trustees. And you know, it was quite nice for the most part, you know, <coughs> meeting these, um, these people from the museum. But one of the trustees was like, you know, what, what is the use of this? Like, what is the, what is, how, how is this useful? Like, what, how, how could you use it? And I, I couldn't really, like, respond. I was really, like, flustered. Um, and so I tweeted it. And it's actually quite, I will just say this thread is really beautiful. Like, I tweeted about, you know, I don't, I wish I could come up with a good line. 
Um, and people came up with like, you know, clever things to say, but my favorite thing is this, this line, you know, my favorite art makes me feel an idea. And I think about, I, you know, I was thinking about this in the last 24 hours, like what we're trying to do, or at least, you know, what I feel like this exhibit is about is trying to feel this idea. So thank you. We're going to have uh, 15 minutes to talk. We're going to clear the room at 8 o'clock. That's what we do, like television. We're in, we're out. Okay. Um, and I, I'm just so moved and excited by hearing what everybody had to say. And I'm going to ask a couple questions, but I really want to hear from this amazing audience. And I, I know many of them were, came to, to see what, what this is all about. I, Luke, um, you, since you didn't met, discuss your piece in your remarks, right. so I wanted to say something about Luke's piece. That he, he, he made a piece where um, the computer figures out who you are and it's usually wrong. Um, and I thought you could say, why in the hell did you do that, Luke? And what, you know, tell us what, it's, you know, explain to these people. So I, I made a just sort of dystopian photo booth. So you, you hit a button and you sit down and then it orders you to emote in a certain way. So it'll pick a random emotion and be like, your emotion is sad. Be sad for 30 seconds. And then it'll judge you and tell you how well you did. <laughs> and then along the way, it will also um, take a crack at guessing your age and race and gender and point out that that classification system is in active use all over the place in America all the time without your consent, right? And so the reason it's often wrong is the, 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 the way I made the piece was I put myself in the shoes of a mid-level software engineer at a startup whose <laughs> boss called him and was like, you have to use AI. <laughs> and so I did all the stuff that you would do if you were a person whose boss ordered. So I, so I Googled it. I downloaded some stuff. I, I called my dear friend, Caitlin Sakura, who's in the audience, who, who actually works at Google and knows how this shit works, and asked her to help me. Um, I, uh, you know, so I did all the sort of stuff that you would do if you were you know, sort of a, a machine learning newbie. And the really upsetting part of that is that there are quite a large number of off-the-shelf, free, open-source data sets that purport to allow for this kind of recognition and they're all deeply, deeply flawed, either technically, ethically, usually both, and I implemented all of them. <laughs> um, and so it will screw up. As yeah. you can experience it. Yeah. Right, I mean, you can feel the idea of AI failing. And that is really part of what we want to do with this show is not do like a whiz bang technology show, but actually show that there's a history behind it, that this is not something invented today by some asshole at Google, you know, that it, people long ago have had these bad ideas. But that also you can do beautiful things with them. And I feel like, Zach, that's part of what you do. Like when we first started working on this show, Zach would come to the meetings and go, I don't want to address surveillance. <laughs> like, I'm not doing another surveillance art piece. So can you tell us about that, about why you uh, felt that way? And yeah. you need the microphone, oh, you need yeah, to speak yeah. into it. I mean, mm, can you speak into the Yeah, microphone? sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, um, yeah I, I was quite interested in yeah, trying to explore you know, this this space of how the computer is sensing our expression and you know emotional state, but not I. Not that I have anything against sur surveillance art, but I didn't want it to be about surveillance. I wanted it, you know, I wanted to make something which was weird and you know strange and playful and, and organic. And there, for me, there was something so beautiful in London, you know, because I was like, oh, maybe my piece is not political enough. Like, I'm always second-guessing myself. So I'm making this, like, you know, it's blobs and lines and, and fun. And, and I'm sitting there, you know, sort of tweaking the software, and then they turned on, Jessica, they turned on your, um, your videos. And there were these amazing images that were just, it was actually so 
lovely to be in this kind of room where these pieces were really in, in dialogue with each other. So my, my, you know, you're using this like kind of playful blob thing, but you look over to the side and you see this, these diagrams from your book. And for me, that was the joy of uh, being in an exhibit like this. Great, and I have just one question for Jessica, then we'll open it up to the, the, to the floor. It seems like a lot of what is interesting to you about the face is somehow the face made artificial or strange or uncanny in this um, capturing it through numbers or making these rubber babies. What, what is it about the it's quantified the face? It's all about the rubber babies. Sorry. Um, well, I, I think I began this project and the work for the book because I have this great antipathy about selfie culture. And it may be because of my generation, but I don't understand with all the problems we have in the world why we spend so much time photographing ourselves and not other more important things. And yet, at the same time, uh, there's the very real fact that not you're an identical twin. So this is an interesting question. So even I identical have a creepy copy. Yeah. You have a copy, but and you can probably open each other's iPhone tens. Absolutely. But a child uh, under the age of I think twelve cannot because the musculature of the face has not been set yet. So you have to have the maturity of a face that matches the other person. And then of course you know one of you doesn't gain four hundred pounds or something. But be that as it may, the idea that really got me was that. The one thing you have that is yours is your face. So here is this highly individualized thing, which may explain why we try to measure it, but it's also the fact that we're all capitulating to systems like Facebook and Snapchat, and I'm in, I also have an antipathy about the forms, right? The fact that all of our Facebook pages look alike, and all of our Twitter feeds look alike, and we are willingly participating in something that doesn't differentiate us because it can't differentiate us because our picture has to be a certain size. And that, then I started to look back at things like ID cards and, and, and passports, which of course have other things in them that say something really more about the country and the politics. But that are this very uniform mugshot kind they of They are. There's, this, there's this perfunctory quality. And, and one of the things that to me was the most poignant in, in the pictures that I came across, because I'm a big, as a, as a person who loves history and as an ephemera collector, I'm really interested in found photographs and vernacular photographs. And I was on sabbatical in Paris a couple of years ago, and there's a man who has a shop, really nasty guy, but he has great stuff. And I would go visit him, because the best thing he had was this giant box in front of the store of ID pictures that had fallen off ID cards. So there were these like orphan photographs that had just seceded from the families into which they were born. They had seceded from the forms that I collect. And all they were were these photographs. And most of them were taken during the war. And many of them were of children. And I knew how many children had been deported from Paris during the war. And so I just, I mean, I spent hours combing through these photographs because there's a, almost a theatrical quality of trying to resurrect some history that you're well, imagining. they are an index of someone who's no longer. And so there. then you're applying, you may not be applying a Facebook form, you're applying your own contextual, obligatory uh, sense of how you make sense of the world around that photograph. And so my book is all about the fact that we're all biased, the fact that you can't actually get away from judgment, that all context forces us, obliges us to think about judgment in some way. And I, and I just love portraits and faces and photographs and children and, yeah, I'm stuck. Okay. <laughs> and you, you love it and it's a scary future. Okay. So uh, we have a few minutes left for some questions from uh, the audience. What do you want to know or share or needle us about? Hello out there. Yes, I see someone in the back. Thank you. So one of the things is that you mainly hear this fear-based, focused talk when you talk about AI. And in all of the applications that we're talking about, you're exploring it. So it's continuing the science down that path. It's continuing the applications in daily life. How, what applications do you see in which, because we're not going to take technology away, right? Like it's not going anywhere. We are continuing down this path. Right? How do you use it in a way that is not about surveillance and more about observation or engagement? So, so, there, so there's a bunch 
there's a there, so there's a, so my response to that is always that AI is not full is not captured entirely by things like surveillance, capitalism, facial recognition, whatever. So like right. I you know so I, I you know I I teach with this guy named Guido Garrick who uses machine learning to detect early um, you know early incidents of, of of brain cancer, right? So he's using fMRI imagery. Right? And so he's got, so it's, it, it would be the same kind of idea as what goes into to the technology which behind Zach's piece or my piece, right? He's got a million photographs of people who've had brain cancer. He has, sets the computer loose on it, says what the hell is the pattern here? And then when you take a live fMRI, you can start to see it, right? Um, and so that is, you know, we can all probably get behind that. That's okay, right? That's a good use of machine learning. Um, there's there's lots of other ones. There's lots of creative uses of machine learning. That's why I played you this ridiculous Philip right. Glass mashup, right? Like that's a that's a, that's using that same technology. It's called style modeling and it's in the visual arts shows up in a panoply of media artwork where you sort of like make a David Bowie video look like a Picasso or whatever, but it's that exact same technique, right? It's called style transfer. Um, and in music it just has a different kind of vibe to it. Um, yeah, I mean, but there is lots of stuff. I think the, the, the big thing with the facial, with the facial recognition and the, and the AI stuff that we're talking about is that, in, in the, and Karen will have like a really good riff on this if you see her program, I'd assume. But yeah, it, Karen but Palmer, because October that's what her practice is about, is, is just, a, is just a, you know, the, the, it's all, it's very, it's very situational and contextual. And this bias very much does exist. So it's not so much about rewinding the clock on the technology, but it's more about situating the people who develop that technology and then deploy that technology in an ethical framework where they don't use systems that discriminate, right? Um, and so. And I think a big problem going on now is that there's too much trust in the technology. Yeah. So when law enforcement, local, Police, you know, uh, agencies buy Amazon recognition tools. They don't know that it's not accurate, and they're like, "Oh, it's the computer. Trust the computer." And then these things are used to falsely accuse people and um, amplify bias and it get is, people it is, it in trouble a, forever. You yeah, know? it is a big mistake to think computers are, are always right. A more correct formulation of that is computers will always do what they're told, right? right? And so that's an important piece of like media literacy or digital literacy that everybody needs to kind of like get behind in the 21st century because that's that's otherwise we're all going to die. Right, so I think if you come, come up to it, yeah, we all will anyway, but yeah. if you come to the exhibition, you can really experience this. And I, I think what's really intriguing to me about Zach's pieces in the show are how they kind of reveal the primitive quality of it. There's almost like a back to the Bauhaus AI experience where you see your face reduced to this line that is tracing what your nose wrinkler is doing and your eyebrow razor. And it's like a new way of looking at your face that's also extremely familiar and primitive. And I think seeing the kind of um, at bottom simplicity of it is sort of demystifying. And that's what makes it a design exhibition that we're trying to look at uh, the how and the why and the what behind stuff that's very mysterious and um, treated as kind of uh, a magical force, right? Tech, it's magic, it's not really. And I think what all of you have done is to really kind of let us look inside. And I have one minute. <laughs> yes, and yes, you were here first and you're gonna get the last word. <laughs> Big six. I, I wanna hear a little bit about uh, emotion detection. I wonder if given that we do have more happiness pictures, or at least this like selfie culture cosmetic happiness data, is there likely to be there's eventually this confusion, confusion by these algorithms? Like the sadness being like, there aren't that many pictures of people being sad or performing sadness, but there are pictures of people performing happiness, way more. So. I want to hear about what, what do you think it's going to be 
The Alchemuff. I just love performing sadness as my band name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Do you want to answer that? No. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you can, you can, s yeah, you can see that in, you know, the, um, you know, if you go upstairs and you look at the sort of diagnostic screen, you know, it'll tell you how the computer is reading sadness, happiness, etc. And it's really good at detecting a kind of expressed happiness, right? As soon as you smile, as soon as it sees teeth, you know, it it's like a it's like I just call it a, ha a, a smile detector because it's trained the the number of images that you know the database is trained on. There's so many more images that are labeled as happy, and you know it's. Um, it's like, it, it's kind of poor in a way. Like it's, it's, it's worthwhile to try it because you can see, you know, it, it d does detect anger, but it's very subtle or fear, um, surprise. They're, they're quite subtle in a way. And, you know, in a way, the project invites you to perform and to, you know, to kind of train your face to how the computer will, will perceive it, not how, you know, natural. So I really love watching people use it because they start to emote and and get a little crazy to get a response from from the machine. Yeah, like and trying to get it to recognize disgust. Yeah, you people just go like that. Yeah. You know? yeah, and but I think that is what what that last slide I said was about trying to feel an idea. Like I think these projects are really about trying trying to help you feel this the space between these algorithms, how we think about these algorithms and how they actually work. That's a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming out. The first night